Uh, welkom en fijn dat je nog steeds kijkt naar de Innovatie Expo 2021. Uh, we zijn terug, we gaan luisteren naar een keynote van professor Mariana Matsukatu. Uh, bekend van verschillende boeken, onder andere de Entrepreneurial State... maar ook dit boek, Mission Economy. Het zijn uh, bekende uh, boeken die ook door beleidsmakers veel gelezen worden... en waar veel aan gerefereerd gaat worden. We gaan het uh, dit uur, want we gaan een uur praten, uh, als volgt doen. We beginnen zo meteen met een verhaal van Mariana... die op afstand bij ons is, hier op uh, de schermen in de studio. En daarna praten we hier aan tafel aan de hand van drie thema's verder. Gasten die zo meteen aanschuiven zijn Mona Keizer, die zit hier al. Uh, staatssecretaris van het ministerie van Economische Zaken en Klimaat. Welkom en fijn dat u er bent. Uh, Stientje van Veldhoven, die schuift zo meteen ook aan. Haar stoel staat al klaar en zij zal zo meteen ook meepraten. Staatssecretaris van het ministerie van Infrastructuur en Waterstaat. En voor de rest zit hier Robert-Jan Smits, de president van Eindhoven University of Technology. Welkom. Collega Richard van der Zanden, die was eerder vandaag al te gast in onze shows. Fijn dat je er bent. En Jaap Bond is ook bij ons voorzitter van de topsector Horticulture en Starting Materials. Welkom Jaap en fijn dat je er bent. Dat was de introductie in het Nederlands. Uh, we gaan nu over in het Engels. Uh, Mariana, nice to have you in our show. Uh, and I would like to invite you to start with your keynote. Go ahead, please. Fantastic. Let me first just share the screen, which is the hardest bit. Uh, hold on. <laughs> There we go. Can you just confirm you see something? Yeah? I don't hear you. We can see it. Yeah. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Good. It's always good to check. So uh, thank you. I'm going to put on my timer so I don't speak more than 20 minutes. It's, it's a pleasure to uh, be speaking to you. I've been interacting with your uh, uh, you know, Dutch missions and the top sector approach and bigger issues also in terms of uh, directing innovation towards solving big societal challenges now for quite some time. So I'm especially looking forward to the Q&A. What I'd like to do is really to focus on, on some of the lessons from my recent book uh, called Mission Economy. It will be coming out Dutch soon. Um, about also how to really foster a different form of public-private partnership. I think this sometimes goes missing in the concept of missions. We just think about the output, you know, whether it's around water, whether it's around climate and so on. But the, the how to work together between business, government, also other institutions, whether it's universities or the third sector, I personally think that's the hardest bit. <laughs> that's the bit that really requires a new deal, a new social contract. So I, I really want to bring back the discussion to that because I know also that in the Netherlands, you've already progressed quite a bit around the concept of missions, but on the how to actually structure the collaborations, but also the tools that the state has, all the tools, procurement, grants, loans, industrial strategy, to be more mission-oriented. I think this could be a, an interesting part of our discussion together. And I think, you know, the COVID moment, which is a new moment for all of us in terms of how I've been engaging also with the Netherlands, is one that, if anything, has only highlighted even more the need for really thinking about government capacity. It's, again, not just about great goals. It's about what is the capacity on the ground? Do we actually have it in order to deliver Uh, when we have just such such urgent uh, priorities that uh, need to be solved, whether it's the personal protection equipment, the vaccine, resolving big issues around the digital divide. I think what we've seen globally is that countries are, are, are actually not prepared for this. Um, in, in many ways, you know, this has required a very quick transition, similar to what we had with World War II, when you had the automobile industry had to transform into the wartime industry. That didn't happen just like that. That required a whole new understanding of how a government business, but also in the, back then it was also trade unions that really also allowed that to happen. Um, but also what's been interesting, I think globally, is that some countries that have surprised us in terms of their performance have been countries like Vietnam or Kerala and the state of India, which, you know, it's just surprising in terms of how well they've done given where they are in the development trajectory, but it's been very much on the back of investments they have been making for the last decades within their public administration. And I really want to keep coming back to this issue of the public administration. It's not just about the state, but how do we administer what we do? Um, and of course, you know, one of the big problems we have is that the COVID moment is on the back of other big crises we have, and we're simply not moving quick enough. The climate one, of course, is the biggest one uh, that we should all be focusing on. And it's quite uh, sad, I think, that even just last year, in terms of EU subsidies, we continue to throw them at problematic types of um, projects, you know, uh, 
projects based on fossil fuels, but even the COVID-19 recovery funds in the G20 countries, over 56% of those that have gone to energy have gone to ones which are still fossil fuel focused. So we're, we're not doing what Greta Thornburg tells us, which is when your house is on fire, get the hell out. You don't just sit there and kind of you know, debate what to do. And really what I've been arguing for some time is that we should be focusing on the current challenges we have are not so much you know, the moon landing and big missions, but very much trying to see how can we transform these 17 goals that every country, Netherlands, the UK, the US, Congo, Brazil have signed up to, what does it actually mean to transform these bold SDGs into missions, into missions that really do you know, uh, uh, involve lots of different sectors, but especially that require us to rethink what is the actual administration that we need on the ground in order to deliver on them. So whether it's climate, whether it's COVID, whether it's the digital divide, whether it's these broader missions around gender parity and so on, what does it actually mean to take them so seriously like we do during wartime scenarios? And one of the problems that I've been highlighting for a long time is that the framing of policy really needs to move away from at best, you know, at worst, get out of the way, the Reagan line, but at best one of just fixing different types of market failures. And of course, with innovation and industrial strategy, we know there's different types of market failures that arise when we have you know, positive externalities, negative externalities. But the problem is that we cannot just continue to think that we just have to patch something up here and there, right? You know, a bit of R&D spending here, a bit of SME financing there. Um, you know, what does it actually mean to transform a system and to have policy redesigned to co-create and co-shape um, the market itself, the economy itself? And by the way, in the UK, I don't know if this happened also in the Netherlands, in the UK, it's been fascinating. There's been a whole debate, both around Brexit and the COVID moment, where there's been data that's been kind of revealed of just how much the government has been relying on consulting companies, you know, the McKinsey's, the PwC's, Deloitte was asked to do our test and trace system, which did not go too well. The vaccine, on the other hand, has been rolled out through our NHS, the National Health Service. But this picture here is of Lord Agnew in the uh, UK uh, government. Um, and he you know, used this word that I started to use because I find it very useful. He said that when you overly use outsourcing to deliver kind of public programs and, and do project management really within government, you end up infantilizing the civil service. And so what does it mean again to, yes, of course, work with the private sector, but to always be investing within the capabilities, what I call the dynamic capabilities of the public sector along the way. And you know, a lot of this you know, learning, if you want, that's come from COVID is very much about the capacity to adapt and learn, to align public services and citizen needs, to govern resilient production systems and adapt them when times change towards you know, delivering uh, uh, what we require and the capacity to govern data and digital platforms. This has been very important, of course. Uh, um, so what I'd like to just really quickly focus on is the need to, um, you know, kind of break down what actually happened when we went to the moon. This is something new. I haven't really been talking about it in the last years. This is more around my recent book is what I discovered in doing the research was that NASA, for example, really cared about the details. They didn't just write a procurement contract. They cared about how the procurement contract could actually galvanize, nurture, catalyze as much innovation as possible throughout the economy. And you know, also that speech that Kennedy gave back in 1962, I think we don't appreciate enough the fact that they had no clue how to get to the moon. You know, there was different ways that they were debating at the time. They finally ended up with a lunar orbit rendezvous way, but the level of risk-taking, the kind of welcoming of uncertainty uh, was, was quite extraordinary. Um, and, you know, they realized very early on that they had to change within their own organization in order to be purpose-driven. At that time of the tragic day in 1967 of the Apollo 1 fire that killed three astronauts, one of the astronauts, basically just before the fire, said, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can, within government, not eat, well, sorry, within NASA, not even talk between two or three buildings? And, you know, within government, I'm sure a lot of the civil servants that will be listening know that this is often a complaint, right, that each department is, is kind of working within their own silo, the Department of Energy, the Department of Innovation, the Department of Health, the Department of Education, the Treasury. So what does it mean to do exactly what they did which is to say, if we are going to be purpose driven and have this goal of getting to the moon and back again within one generation, let's look within how we have to change our own structures to be more adaptive, more flexible, be 
be able to pivot in that kind of famous DARPA kind of way. Um, and also, you know, so many of the spillovers that actually came about along the way, you know, what does it mean to be able to evaluate along the way of trying to achieve a bold mission, all the things that happen across the economy? I, I realized recently that with the Concorde plane, which so many people, you know, think is a, is a massive failure, it's often used as an example of government doing things wrong. Actually, there's never been a study that has looked at what are all these investments that occurred across the economy, across the European economy in different sectors when trying to actually get the Concorde to be a successful uh, project. So I personally don't think that we should be going down the Concorde route, you know, picking winners, just picking one big project. But even when we do that, if it's a public project and not a private project, we have to be able to really realize that even if the plane's not flying, do we even understand those kind of dynamic spillovers that occur across the economy? And one of the things, again, that I already mentioned that I found the most fascinating in doing some of the research was that NASA was careful. They wanted to make sure that in welcoming all the risks that I already mentioned that they took, they also shared in the rewards. So they had things like no excess profits clauses in their procurement contracts. They also, you know, uh, were careful to move away from what at the time was a cost plus contract where they would, you know, basically just pay for any costs that businesses are charged to them towards a fixed price contract with constant incentives, continual incentives for innovation and quality improvement. So this idea of public and private working together, but with a purpose, had to then land literally at the design of the contracts themselves. And they also, and this was fascinating for me, were you know, thinking about that infantilization of the public sector that I just mentioned, they were aware of that problem. There was this phrase that I discovered that the uh, head of procurement inside NASA said, he said, if we don't invest within our own brain, within the state, within the public sector, within NASA, we will end up getting captured, he said, by brochuremanship. So they didn't have PowerPoints at the time, but they had you know, businesses that would come in with sexy brochures, and they said, we need to really know how to write the terms of reference and partner in a way that actually reflects what we want to do, and we can't do that if we ourselves within government don't have those uh, capabilities. So he warned about the dangers of outsourcing too much. And so again, these lessons, I think, are absolutely central for tackling the kind of missions that I know you're thinking about in um, the Netherlands. But also we should, of course, remember that many of these societal missions that we have, whether they are around climate, whether they are around, again, areas like the digital divide and so on, these in the end are societal. So they're much harder. They're actually not just technological. You know, they require behavioral change, regulatory change, a political change, as well as social, organizational, and technological innovation. And I know you already know a lot about this approach, so I won't bore you with it. But I think what we need to remember is not to confuse kind of challenges with missions, with sectors and projects, right? Beginning with the really bold challenges, designing missions that get lots of different sectors involved, right? So seeing water, not as a sector, but as a problem that requires even 10 different sectors to get involved. And that redesign of the procurement, the grants and the, grants and the loans to foster that bottom-up innovation, just like they had, uh, you know, to get to the moon where it wasn't just aeronautics, it was also lots of investment in electronics, materials, nutrition, software, massive you know, outcome of the moon mission. So that kind of real cross-sectoral approach, and this is why in my uh, past visits to the Netherlands, I always said, you know, be careful with the top sector approach, because you don't want to think about a random list of sectors that you want to prioritize. You need to focus on problems that in society you agree on are very important and get all your sectors uh, you know, to, to be involved. Um, so as you know, with the European report that I wrote on the back of which missions became um, kind of a legal instrument, some of the examples I brought up were, you know, around climate change. So hard, 100 carbon neutral cities would, of course, involve uh, not just renewable energy, but also new forms of real estate, construction, uh, the social sector, food, and so on. Um, just quickly, I wanted to um, just focus on the opportunities that we have today in terms of really rethinking the state, the, you know, the state apparatus, the public administration. And this wonderful quote by Barack Obama, who said that, you know, we live and do business in the information age, the knowledge economy, but the last time we reorganized government actually happened in the age of black and white TV. 
So this is why it's really important to go back to the metrics that we have. So in your treasury, I remember when I met with uh, uh, Minister Kemp when I came some years ago, you know, what does it mean for the treasury and the ministers of finance to also think in this kind of mission-oriented way where the dynamic spillovers themselves, as I was talking before, are part of that evaluation. So, you know, not just looking at cost-benefit analysis and net present value, but really rethinking the metrics within. Um, so it's not just about the remit, what to do, but once you've done something bold, how do we know whether it actually achieved, um, you know, the, that, that kind of intersectoral and catalytic uh, effect that is required in order to crowd in as much business investment as possible. In the UK, I work very closely with the government precisely to uh, get away from the um, idea of a top sector strategy. They had five sectors at the time. They had aeronautics, automobiles, life sciences, financial services, and the creative sector as the five top sectors in the UK that they wanted to nurture. Um, forget what Brexit has now done to uh, UK investment, but anyway, and I helped them really rethink that around these four bold, broad challenges, you know, clean growth, aging, future mobility, AI, and the data economy, but also then worked very closely with them through a commission that I organized, um, co-chaired by uh, Lord Willits uh, and myself. So we looked at, for example, the future mobility strategy and, and worked with the government to form uh, missions, including this one here around future mobility that had within it the idea of universally accessible travel so that some of those bottom-up projects that I mentioned would include, for example, those in the areas of disabilities. Um, and also, more recently, we've been working with the European Investment Bank and thinking, you know, if, if it's going to be a climate bank, what does it mean for literally how it thinks about its portfolio of investments, the kind of risk-reward process, how it gives out loans in such a way that are less about kind of handouts to particular sectors that are seen as requiring need, but also really to, to, to put at the center also some stronger conditionalities, similar to those, by the way, that I think in Germany in recent years they've had with the KFW, where when the KFW, the German public bank, was asked to help the steel sector, because they had that broad challenge at the top of the Energiewende mission, the KFW in Germany, unlike in many other countries where steel was asking for support, put the condition that the steel sector had to lower its material content in order to access the loan. And they did so by innovating around repurpose, reuse, recycle across the whole innovation chain, not because they woke up and went to Davos and were told to do ESG, but they had to in order to access the loan itself. Um, and also more recently, we've worked in different cities. By we, I mean myself and the Institute I've set up here in London. And in Manchester in particular, it was very interesting working also with citizens at the center of the process of kind of green missions and really looking at carbon neutral living, right? Um, so carbon neutral living from the moment you kind of wake up and get to work, all the different things that can be changing. And the city mayor himself, Andy Burnham and the city team, really working very much at the city level, um, in some ways at the street level, as Sweden has been doing recently to really rethink alongside citizens and stakeholder groups and citizen assemblies, what it means to have carbon neutrality, not kind of top down, but really as an outcome of that stakeholder interaction. More recently in Camden, which is a part of London where I live, what's been interesting is again, these missions that we've been thinking about are landing on concrete places like housing estates, social housing or school meals, making these the kind of funnels through which innovation can occur. So similar um, to what, what's happened, let me just move here to Sweden. In Sweden, you know, they have this overall mission of a fossil-free welfare state. And that means that everything the state does from public education, public health, public transport, has this idea of carbon neutrality at the center. And they've been doing really interesting things, both at the street level, again, with 40,000 kilometers of streets they have in uh, Sweden, but also at the school meal level, they brought students to be part of that process of the co-design of healthy, tasty, sustainable school meals, but also in terms of um, uh, monitoring along the way, whether you know, they're tasty or not. If, if school meals are not tasty, it doesn't matter if they're, not, if, if they're sustainable. So again, this issue of, I think, civil society engagement is very important. And that also is really interesting, I think. If, if we think why so many children today know about the carbon, uh, sorry, the plastic-free ocean mission, it's actually very much due to um, a documentary by David Attenborough, which I'm sure you've all seen, Blue Planet, with that last episode showing lots of dolphins choking you know, on plastic. 
you know, what is the power of the creative sector, the humanities, which I know in uh, the Netherlands, many people in the humanities and the social sciences felt that they were being left behind uh, by some of the missions that were a bit too much just around STEM subject. What does it mean to have the power of creativity, sorry, creativity, poetry, you know, theater, uh, a cinema to help us reimagine where we want to go, right? So in terms of the actual missions you have around you know, health, agriculture, water, food, and so on, what, how can we embed within that a discussion within you know, different types of citizens groups on you know, what is this for? How do we as a society want to live together? What does it mean to have sustainable living? I think this for me is one of the bits that uh, governments are least prepared for. It actually requires a, 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 an engagement with citizens that, that is not necessarily even in the training programs we have with civil servants, Empathy 101. Uh, but also I think we need to bring this concept of stakeholder value to the core of the process. And you know, this is something that businesses like Unilever have talked about for a long time, but stakeholder value cannot just be a, a discussion within corporate governance. Here you have the picture of the business roundtable, the top CEOs, you know, rethinking corporate governance away from just maximizing shares to maximizing stakeholder value, this notion, I, th I think, of purpose and stakeholder value needs to be at the center of the system of how public, private, third sector, citizen groups actually co-design missions, but also really rethink that social contract that I was talking about at the beginning. And my last slide here really just suggests that I do, again, coming back to COVID, think this is the moment you know, to really be bold and experimental, even at the contract level. What we've seen in some countries, like in France, here you have the finance minister in France, is that some countries have been um, willing, if you want, to put this notion of conditionalities at the core of the COVID recovery scheme. So in France, uh, both Air France and Renault had to commit to lowering carbon emissions in order to get access to the COVID recovery funds. In Denmark and Austria, they had to commit to not using tax havens, something that I think would be very useful um, in your part of the world. Um, and, you know, this conditionality word sometimes sounds negative. It sounds like someone's forcing you to do something, but I think it really needs to go to the core of collaborating and building back better for real instead of just the slogan. And the notion of missions at the core really needs to have this idea of the common good and common purpose, you know, at the center. And I do think all this needs to be accompanied by a new vocabulary away from fixing, co-creating to co-creating away from picking winners to picking the willing, getting as much of the business community to be, you know, uh, part of the solution, not part of the problem, away from de-risking to welcoming risk and uncertainty. And we need to admit that it's not about leveling the playing field. It's about tilting it towards the direction and making those really bold decisions on the direction of growth and using a portfolio approach to design missions in such a way that, you know, is not just some big projects here and there, but really is about um, fostering both through direct and indirect uh, investments, a, a, a very different type of a partnership and a trajectory for innovation and uh, industrial strategy. And I will stop sharing my slides now. Okay, that's clear. Uh, and